roughly are we keeping around 5 uh, 10 minutes uh, for q and a at the end of uh, the webinar or i think we're just going as we go isn't it yeah we are live now you can proceed at the end of every talk we'll ask a question and probably as neeraj had said because it's more of a tv thing the chances of you getting questions are going to be uh, yeah okay yeah welcome to ortho tv in association with north western education academy uh, to continue i hand over to the moderator of the session professor kuntal patel thank you neeraj and uh, hello everyone um, so i'm just going to share the screen Right. Hope you can all see this. No, we cannot see. You have just shared the folder. I would request you to share the full screen. Just stop. I will stop your screen share. Okay. And yeah, now share it again. But share the full screen, the first one. Yes. Yes. Okay. Right. Hello, everyone. Um, uh, thanks, Neeraj, and thanks, everyone. Uh, so today we're going to discuss about the current concepts in managing instability in relation to total hip replacements. We've got uh, really eminent faculty here, um, uh, Nikhil Pradhan, Deepak Herlekar, uh, Josh Bridgen, and Ravi Badge. And the topics we'll cover is prevention of dislocation and management overview, dual mobility, uh, modular versus monoblock dual mobility, constraint liners, and we'll go to some case discussions. There's any uh, email address here, if you would like to note down, that would be great. Um, if you could kindly email us after the webinar, we should be able to provide you with uh, course certificates as well. Okay, so um, I'll start off. So my talk is on prevention of hip dislocation and management uh, overview. Uh, I'm a consultant orthopedic surgeon uh, in Lancaster um, and I have a keen academic interest as well. Um, and I, I lecture for HL University and I'm a professor with Cumbria University as well. So this is my department in Lancaster, northwest of UK. It's a beautiful part of the world. You're, you're welcome to come and uh, uh, join us or visit us. We run an international visitation center for complex hip revision surgery. The topic I'll cover is the factors that contribute to hip dislocation. Um, how is it different in managing early versus late dislocation? How would you evaluate an unstable total hip replacement? And most importantly, how do you manage recurrent dislocation? So we all know that hip dislocation remains a problem following total hip replacement. For primary hip replacement, the risks are around one to 3%, whereas for revision hip surgery, it goes as high up as average of three to 10%. And if you look at the NJR data from UK, it um, is the third highest uh, third commonest cause for revision hip surgery. Let's look at the factors that contribute to hip dislocation. So I would divide them into patient factors and surgical factors. So let's look at some patient factors. Is age a, a contributor to hip dislocation? Probably yes, and advanced age does contribute to that, but it's not just the age in itself, but it's things like dementia, things like compliance issues, uh, and general frailty. Hip range of motion, so people who are very active, want to get back to uh, sporting activities, skiing, things like that, uh, can contribute to hip dislocation. Previous hip surgery, including cases like previous femoral fracture fixation, non-union, AVN. High BMI over 30 is a definite contributing factor for instability. 
conditions like stroke, Parkinson's, epilepsy, uh, i.e. neuromuscular disorders, attribute to dislocation. Any mental health issues, uh, dementia, and hence lack of compliance can cause that. And alcohol abuse, substance abuse, exposure to neurotoxins, again, impairs uh, your judgment and hence contributes to instability. Let's look at some more factors. Are there any factors that haven't been proven beyond doubt to increase the risk of dislocation? Uh, sex, um, I don't think there's uh, any enough evidence to, to say there is higher risk of dislocation for males versus females. If you were thinking about um, sex post hip surgery, uh, I would leave that to your imagination as a contributing factor. Uh, simultaneous bilateral hip replacements does not uh, increase the risk of dislocation. And the restrictive post-operative precautions, any post-operative hip bracing hasn't been proven beyond doubt. And there may be uh, things that we can do to improve uh, and potentially reduce the risk of dislocation, things like navigated surgery, um, robotic surgery, and thereby both of which in theory can improve your alignment of components, use of lip liners and dual mobility. Uh, surgical factors is where you and I can control um, um, and thereby minimize the risk of uh, dislocation. Hence, these are very important. Let's look at some of these. Most important is surgical approach, femoral head diameter, um, and I'll go through each of these in the next few slides. Component orientation, restoration of leg length and offset, cam impingement, condition of soft tissues, uh, status of abductors, and revision hip surgery. So let's look at surgical approach. So these are some of the commonest approaches that we use in hip surgery. Um, there are enough studies out there showing that posterior, hip, hip, uh, uh, posterior approach to the hip surgery has the highest risk of dislocation. However, there are um, quite a few studies subsequently with reinforced repair of the posterior structures. That risk is almost similar to the entrolateral approach. And anterior approach or the Amis approach has the lowest risk of dislocation, as you can see in the graph as well. Femoral head diameter is one of the most important factors that the surgeon decides during the surgery. Um, and it affects the stability in a few ways. It obviously affects your head, neck, head, neck diameter and thereby the sliding distance and jump distance. And therefore, in theory, the larger the head size, the more stable the hip will be. However, there are pitfalls of a larger head because with a larger head, there's increased torque and thereby increased risk of craniosis. And more importantly, with a very large head as well, there'll be increased risk of poly wear. So let's look at some data from the Dutch registry. So if you look at cumulative revision um, due to dislocation, uh, just for the head size, clearly 36 millimeter head has the lowest risk of dislocation and lowest risk of revision hip surgery. However, if you look, for, look at revision for all causes, in relation to the head size, 32 fares the best because with 36, as I mentioned, there's increased risk for poly wear. So the take home message really uh, uh, is 32 millimeter head is a good balanced choice for most hip surgeons. Next, let's go on to component orientation. So during any hip replacement surgery, we uh, want to make sure our acetabulum and the femur is well aligned, well orientated. So we, we've always focused on this 11x safe zones with about 40 degrees of inclination and about 15 degrees of antiversion. Because if you uh, antivert it too much or if the cup is open, you risk anterior dislocation. And equally, if the cup is too closed or retroverted, you risk posterior dislocation. So look at this picture A. Uh, if the cup is quite antiverted, as you can see, in picture B, you can see that the hip can dislocate anteriorly. In picture C, you can see the cup is quite open and hence it risks superior dislocation. And in picture E, as you can see, the cup is retroverted. And therefore, as you can see in picture F, you can see the risk of posterior dislocation. And we need to also bear in mind the effect of sagittal pelvic tilt. So, if you look at the 
diagram A on the top left. It's a CT scan um, measuring antiversion of around 13 to 14 degrees. And this is a normal supine CT scan of SAWR component. And the picture B shows you a CT scan in a standing position with the measured antiversion of only around four degrees. Uh, so as you can see, with the pelvic tilt, when you stand up, um, the antiversion decreases substantially. So the take home message is that you should aim for at least 15 degrees of antiversion during the surgery because you're doing that in the supine or lateral position. In terms of the femoral component orientation, you aim for the femoral stem antiversion of around 10 to 15 degrees or essentially remain parallel to the neck in most cases. Because if the stem is too antiverted, again, you risk anterior dislocation. If the stem is retroverted, you risk posterior dislocation. What we should bear in mind is what is most important here is combined antiversion between the cup and the stem, which we generally aim around 25 to 30 degrees. Other important factor in hip surgery is restoration of leg length and offset, um, because that's very important. Um, if you've shortened the leg, there is increased telescoping. Equally, if you tighten it too much, it can cause abductor pain and potential dislocation as well. Cam impingement. So few factors can affect this, as I've mentioned on the left here. So smaller the head, smaller the head neck ratio. Any skirting on the femoral head cause impingement, causes impingement, as you can see on the picture. Prominent lip of the cup, retained osteophytes anteriorly. So that's a very critical step. Once you've implanted your trial or definitive cup, you need to remove the anterior osteophytes or any cement for that matter in cemented cups or any hypertrophic soft tissue. Soft tissues play a very important role in uh, uh, instability. So if there is an entrolateral approach and if the abductors fail to heal or there's an early traumatic dislocation, both of which can contribute to dislocation. And if the hip replacement has been done through a greater trochantric osteotomy, and if that's not healed, it is a big factor causing hip dislocation. And revision hip surgery, as we discussed in the very first slide, that the risk is double lift, not more, in for dislocation with revision hip surgery. And that risk increases further with established trochanteric nerve union or a smaller head size. And it decreases with the use of larger head size, lip liner, or use of dual mobility. So these are some of the things we use for revision of surgery. Management, let's think, break it down in terms of times in surgery and number of dislocations. So these two are important factors that help you manage these patients. So in terms of timing, you can divide hip dislocations into three categories. Early, which is within the first three to six months, and that's either due to lack of compliance or early traumatic dislocation causing disruption of soft tissue. Then you have a secondary dislocation, which is between the initial few months and up to five years. And this is when the patients have tried to resume their normal activities, including sporting activities, and can have dislocation of the hip. And you can have a late dislocation, which is generally after five years, often associated with polyvare of their stubborn component. How do you evaluate an unstable hip? You need to know what's the direction of dislocation. When you take them for MUA in theater, it's very important to see how easy or difficult it was to reduce the hip. And what is the stability post-reduction? This is a step often missed by a lot of the junior orthopedic surgeons. As soon as it's in, the job is done and it's, it's actually not. You need to check how uh, stable it is and, in, and if it's unstable in what direction it is. And telescoping uh, is important and that helps to determine the soft tissue tension. Okay, so when there is a case of early dislocation, the main of treatment is closed reduction. And it's generally successful in two thirds of the cases. And as I mentioned before, when you reduce it, always evaluate the uh, stability post-reduction. However, there'll be indications or there'll be instances where you cannot get a close reduction. And buttonholing of the head through the hip capsule is an important factor causing that. So if you cannot achieve a close reduction, 
be prepared to do an open reduction. When you do an open reduction, always assess the stability of the stem, the acetabulum, and the modular components. If there is any instability or loosening of the stem or a, a lack of a, a problem with the orientation, be prepared to change these modular components. And then we go on to surgical management. So these are the cases, uh, and we are talking about early uh, revision surgery, um, because if you're worried about component dissociation, as you can see on the x-ray on the top right, uh, the cup has dislodged 10 days post-op, and therefore you have to revise the cup. In terms of late dislocation, the mainstay of treatment generally is revision hip surgery. Close reduction clearly has a role when it's a first or second dislocation, or the components are still very well fixed and well orientated. So for, for a recurrent dislocation, uh, for a late dislocation, the common causes are polywear, loosening, or component mount orientation, and hence revision hip surgery plays an important role. So how do we conduct uh, or manage these unstable hips. So let's look at some of the options we have in our armamentarium. One of them is something as simple as just changing modular components. Let's go up the, the reconstruction ladder. What else can we do? We then, if you can't just change the head or the liner, you may need to revise components or apply something known as PLAD, which is posterior lip augmentation device. You Along either on its own or in conjunction, you need to consider soft tissue reconstruction if there is any uh, soft tissue uh, uh, disruption. Dual mobility, and we're gonna cover that in the next uh, talk, and constraint line. Okay, so let's just think about changing modular components. So essentially, uh, you could get away with just increasing the femoral head size or diameter, or use a polylip liner for the acetabular component, both of which help improve the stability of the hip joint. As you can see in the picture, there's something known as Bioball Taper Sleeve Adapter. If you've not used that in the practice, you can get that for a range of stems. So if you've got a very well fixed um, femoral stem, you could um, <clears throat> fit these adapters onto the taper of the stem and uh, use the head, which gives you uh, the freedom to in, improve, uh, increase the length or even increase the version. Or you can use a constraint liner within the well-fixed SWR component. So the next step, if you can't just change the modular components is you have to think what is the problem. So like you can see on this X-ray, the cup is open, it's worn. So you need to be prepared to revise the cup. The stem was well-fixed and hence it was retained as you can see. So you, you may have to revise one or both components depending on your pre-op planning, what the problem is, and you deal with it accordingly. PLAD is, is essentially stands for posterior lip augmentation device. As you can see on the picture on the top right, or essentially you put it around an acetabular component, which thereby increases the buffer before the head can come out, and there, therefore increases your sliding distance and jump distance. So that was done quite routinely in the past, but for now, with all the modern implants that we have, it's reserved for very low demand patients or patients with significant comorbidities. Because the picture on the left shows that the plaid has worked, but the pitfall is, as you can see on the right, you can easily dislocate the hip through a plaid as well. And the difficulty is, if it dislocates through a plaid, it's often very difficult to perform a close reduction. Soft tissue reconstruction. So I think I'll emphasize one point here that you should always try and repair or reconstruct the soft tissue during any revision hip surgery for instability. And that includes soft tissue repair. If there's a big defect, you could use allograft or a mesh. Think of fixing the greater canter in non-union cases, and even to try and restore the femoral offset and leg length. So this is a, is a good technique by Leo uh, Whiteside, published in 2019. Um, and you can see the gluteus medius and minimus have been repaired through trans osseous sutures. And then a flap of gluteus maximus has been created and tensioned and pulled it distally. Okay, so dual mobility um, essentially means head within a head construct. As you can see, there's a small head. Um, and then 
uh, which is locked into a poly component, which then moves within the shell. So essentially, um, you have two interfaces where the hip moves, and therefore it decreases the risk of dislocation. Uh, we're going to cover that specifically in the next couple of talks, so I do not want to dwell here on that. And last but not the least, one very important tool that we have in, a, in our armamentarium is a constraint liner. So as you can see in the picture on the left, the poly uh, is locked into the SWR shell. Um, the head is locked inside the poly, and then the locking ring, as you can see, uh, locks around that poly component, and hence the head uh, and the socket becomes essentially a locked uh, unified construct. But again, we're gonna cover that in the talk towards the end of this webinar series. So last but not the least, how do we devise a treatment algorithm? So look at the cup, is it loose or worn? Is it malpositioned? Is it well fixed? And same assessment applies for the stem. You need to then check the offset, leg length, and more importantly, clinically, or an MRI scan, you need to check the status of abductors. Once you've done your initial assessment, you can look at this algorithm. So, firstly, you need to think, are the components malpositioned or are they in acceptable position? Here, I would like to emphasize that when I say malpositioned, that means in the initial post-op repeat, uh, early dislocation, you check the early post-operative x-rays and unless, you know, there's a huge cup retroversion, open or closed cup, but equally in late dislocations, any wear of the component, um, uh, any wear of poly that you think about would also fall into that category. The second thing you think about, let's look at that arm. Let's say if the components arm arm position or worn. What you need to think about is the uh, soft tissues. So if the abductors are deficient, as you can track that flow chart down, you essentially want to correct the malposition and convert to a constrained cup. Potentially dual mobility will also fall into that category. If you then follow into the arm where the abductors are adequate, and if the modular component, uh, if the femoral component is modular, you may want, you may just be able to correct the malposition, increase the head size. But if it's a non-modular component, you want to correct the malposition and consider trochanteric advancement. If you go in that other limb where the components are in acceptable position with the deficient abductors, again, you want to be thinking of constrained cup. If the abductors are adequate and if the femoral component is modular, again, you can just increase the femoral head size or diameter. But if it's a non-modular component, you may want to consider a trochanteric advancement and if that not, does not work, the last resort would be a constrained cup. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Puntal. That was an excellent talk, very comprehensive, I must say. And um, I did enjoy it. Um, I'm just looking at the chat and looking at some questions. And if I might ask you one question, which was really um, quite an interesting one to me was, um, the fact that you mentioned the standing and the uh, supine CT scan and sure. the effect of a sagittal pelvic tilt, um, mm -hmm. I think that will be very useful for us to understand and for trainees to understand as well. Can you expand that on that, please? Okay, thanks, Nikhil. Very interesting question. So all the CT scans that we do for post-operative assessment are generally done in a supine position. Equally, when we do a hip replacement surgery, it's, it's done patient lying on the table, either, either lateral or supine again. So all that inclination that we, and the version we talk about um, is essentially in a lying down position, which you know, if we aim for around 15 degrees of anti-version, um, that's what we aim for. Now, as you could see on that slide of mine, when you stand up, this, that with the sagittal pelvic tilt, that anti-version decreases to around four degrees. And therefore in that position, with excess external rotation, you could dislocate the, the hip. Hence, the importance of at least having 15 degrees of antiversion. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I would like you to take over and uh, we can go to the next speaker then. Okay, thank you, Nikhil. Um, so actually, you are the next speaker, Nikhil. Um, so um, Nik Nikhil Pradhan um, has more than 30 years of experience in trauma and orthopedics. So let me introduce you uh, to, to, to the delegates. He's been a consultant 
more than 15 years in NHS at Warrington Hospital. He has special interest in hip and knee surgery. Um, and he actually is a design evaluator for iAssist computer navigated knee replacement as well. And he's published very widely. Um, and he's a, let me uh, invite you to start your talk, Nikhil. Uh, thanks a lot, Kuntal. That was a very generous introduction. Thank you. Um, I'll take you through dual mobility, um, its uh, history, its uh, evaluation, um, the biomechanics, and then a little bit on my experience and uh, what is my thought process when I tend to use the uh, dual mobility. So I'm based at Warrington Hospital, which is halfway between Liverpool and Manchester, about 20 minutes uh, from the airport, and that's our um, orthopedic unit in the background. It was Prof. Uh, Busquet in 74, along with his engineer, who designed the concept of uh, dual mobility. And um, it is the French concept of using this in large numbers to try and combine the um, low friction arthroplasty principle of Charnley along with the um, large head stability principle of Makifara. And the idea was to give a better range of motion and at the same time provide stability. So the early designs had some faults which led to increased wear and there were intraprosthetic dislocations and hence the indications and its use were limited. What we find with the uh, newer uh, dual mobility implants is that with better biomechanics and the use of newer uh, materials, especially the polyethylenes, the wear rate is reduced and the risk of an intraprosthetic dislocation is reduced. Um, the FDA gave approval in 2009, which uh, saw increased use in the US. And uh, in mainland Europe, it's been used, especially in France, in big numbers. So if we go to what is the design of a dual mobility hip, then essentially you have a form, small femoral head, which is captive, but mobile within the polyethylene liner. And that is the first articulation on the diagram on your right. The second articulation, is between this large polyethylene liner, which acts as a ball and articulates with the astabular shell, which is a highly polished metal shell. And that's articulation two on your diagram on the right. The articulation three is the articulation between the neck and this polyethylene liner. And we'll discuss this as we go further. So going back to the concept, the concept is really to use the uh, Charnley low friction arthroplasty principle of a small head within a polyethylene liner leading to reduced wear, and then combine that with the Makifara large diameter femoral head concept, which gives enhanced stability. So if you look at the figure A, that shows that within a standard range of motion that we, we would use to walk, for example, it is the articulation between the small head and the polyethylene liner that is used the most, and hence the wear rate is low. Once you then go to a extreme range of motion, you go to figure B, wherein the polyethylene liner then articulates with the large femoral head. And as this is a large femoral head, the range of motion is greater. And as we shall discuss further on, the risk of dislocation is less. If you now look at the figure C, you can see that the edge of this polyethylene liner within is chamfered. And the reason to chamfer this is that so that when you get that third articulation, which, we, which is between the femoral neck and the polyethylene, it's a flat on flat articulation rather than a flat on an edge articulation which would have increased the wear rate of the polyethylene. And then if you look at figure C, what the figure C has, D has achieved is that on the figure D, you have a increased jump distance. 
So this polyethylene liner is not only just a hemisphere, but to this hemisphere, we've added another 11 millimeters so that the jump distance is increased. And these are some of the newer design features in C and D, which reduce the wear and increase uh, of the um, jump distance reduces the risk of an intraprosthetic dislocation. If we look at uh, recent publications, we get an idea of what is the interest in dual mobility. And there is quite a significant interest that we see now. So in 2009, William et al. wrote, should everyone get a dual mobility? Which shows that there is now an interest. If we look at 2018, Horiat and Haddad looked at what is the evidence and what do we need to consider dual mobility? If we then look at NAM et al. in 2019, they looked at, is this a viable option for the young patient? Again, showing that people are getting more and more interested in the dual mobility concept. And Stephen et al. in 2018 published midterm outcomes for the use of dual mobility in revision surgery, giving us some idea of what is the midterm outcome of dual mobility implants. And the reason to consider all of this, the dual mobility concept, is that with all surgical approaches, using any of the models that we know of for hip replacement, and in the hands of all surgeons, there will be a risk of dislocation. And hence, to reduce this risk, we consider the dual mobility concept. And when 2012, when Straw did a literature review, he found that the dislocation rate for a primary total hip replacement was 0.1% with dual mobility implants compared to 2 to 7% for fixed inserts. And in revision surgery, the risk was 3.5 for dual mobility versus 10 to 16% for fixed inserts. And then in, on the EFORD presentation in 2015, patients under 50 years of age were looked at, and that's quite a significant number when you look at 661 uh, young patients having dual mobility. And they found that the dis there were no dislocations, no intraprosthetic dislocations. And the early results showed there was no increased wear. And I must say, this is a short study with a mean follow-up of four years. So we definitely would like to see some long-term outcomes. And when the French Institute looked at what would be the savings, they found that there would be a hundred million euro saving per year if we reduce the dislocation rate from 7% to 0.1% with the hypothetical use of dual mobility for all primary hip replacements in France. So where would I consider dual mobility in my practice in total hip replacement? And I would consider that when I do a complex total hip replacement, a primary where I find it difficult to balance muscle tension versus leg length, and then there's offset to consider, and you might find dual mobility bails me out. In patients who have an increased risk of dislocation, such as neuromuscular disorders, in patients with lack of ability to follow hip precautions, such as patients with dementia. So this is where I would definitely consider a dual mobility implant. And then where would I now that we have some evidence with dual mobility and my experience with dual mobility has increased? Where else would I look at what would be the extended indication? And that extended indication would be possibly for fracture neck of femur patients who need a total hip replacement, as we know that these patients could have an increased risk of dislocation. What about that patient who wants an improved range of motion due to the fact that his profession means that, say, example, he's a plumber and he's got to get into very tight spaces. That might be an indication. The short obese patient with large inner thigh diameters, where it's extremely difficult to get that offset so as to get a stable hip. 
Now we know they have an increased risk of dislocation and dual mobility might be the answer there. And maybe for patients over the age of 80 years or so, where we know that over a period of time, over the next 10 years, the dislocation rate might be higher as things like dementia, Alzheimer's might be a condition that we need to consider. And that I would say is extending your indication gradually towards dual mobility. So what about my experience as such with instability and the dual mobility implant? So when I started my practice about 15 odd years back, this is what I dealt with a lot. The John Lee monoblock stem done where the trochanter did not unite. The um, device that was used to fix the trochanter was taken off eventually. And about 10, 15 years down the line, they come to you with a dislocating hip. Now that the soft tissues have gone lax and you get a dislocation where you find that on EUA, you've got longitudinal laxity along with the fact that you have a dislocating hip. And as um, Kuntal mentioned previously, plaids were used in great numbers. And at that point, we didn't have a lot of constrained liners or dual mobility. So I would consider using the plaid in a very different way. And what I did was I used to use a plaid in the front and a plaid at the back to capture the implant. And essentially we were constraining the implant by using a plaid in the front and the back. And we wrote this up uh, as a method to try and capture the hip in a very select elderly patient population where you want to really have a very quick short surgery uh, for this patient. The disadvantage, if you were to concentrate on the figure on the right, the x-rays on the right, is that you can see that um, almost 13 years down the line, this implant is still in, and luckily it is still in, because you can see metal particles that are floating around in the capsule of this hip. And that's because the neck is impinging against the plaid and you're getting the debris within. Now, luckily this is not pulled out or it's not causing the patient a problem, but that is something that we need to be aware of. So what would I do now? So when I see this, hip that is dislocating and I look at the component and then we look at the cup and as we follow the algorithm on what is wrong and we get a malpositioned cup, I would then now revise it. In this case, I've revised it to a bimentum uncemented cup and um, achieved a very good result. And I find that um, it is easy for me to handle quite a few of the um, algorithm variances using this uh, component. And uh, Kuntal has been very kind to um, allow me to use his slides on this. And this is a patient that he has revised and uh, was referred with a 25 year old uh, male patient who had AVN and had a hip replacement. If you look at the uh, lateral x-ray, you can see that the stem is in a neutral, maybe slightly retroverted position. And um, obviously he was dealt with the situation where he's got a very young patient with an extremely well-fixed stem and whether he should consider revising this stem or what are his options. And um, he has revised it to a bimentum cemented cup, leaving the stem where it is, and then compensated for the version problem in the stem using dual mobility. So to summarize, with the use of uh, newer dual mobility implants with improved design and materials, the early results are definitely encouraging. The outcomes are similar to fixed implants. The wear rate is reduced and the risk of dislocation is reduced. We definitely need long-term follow-up and we need to train surgeons to put the implant in the right way so that the dual mobility function works well. Thank you. Thank you, Nikhil. That was an excellent presentation. Um, may I ask you a question? Of course, Kunta. Um, for neck of femur patients, you, you alluded that they have a high risk of dislocation and we may consider using dual mobility. What's your experience on that? And do you use it for all neck of femurs or only in a select group uh, of very young neck of femurs who benefit from total hip replacement? 
Yeah, that's a very interesting question, Kuntal. Um, and as I alluded, it is uh, where uh, we con I consider that the extended indication would come through. I think what we find is that patients with osteoarthritis, they have a dis decreased risk of dislocation post-operatively. And mm -hmm. with the fracture neck of femur, they are extremely supple and hence the dislocation rate is higher or could be higher. And the consideration here is that if we go down the line of dual mobility implants, now that we feel that the risk of dislocation is lower and the wear rates are not that bad, then yes, I would consider that as a very good option for fracture neck of femur patients um, for me to use in the future. Uh, there are a lot of studies going on this. There is a health and a faith trial going in the US and in Europe looking at comparing hemis versus total hip and uh, looking at the dislocation rates. Excellent. Thank you, Nikhil. That's very useful. Um, okay, I'll introduce Josh Bridgens, our next speaker. Uh, so Josh uh, is a European medical director for Depusynthes. He trained uh, as an orthopedic surgeon in the UK, um, specializing in pediatric orthopedics, uh, actually, and worked as a consultant in Leeds Teaching Hospital for about five years. And since 2015, he's uh, been working with Depusynthes and he's been involved in de uh, developing new products, implant safety, um, and focusing on joint registries. So over to you, Josh. Thank you very much. Can you hear me okay and see my screen? Yes, that's fine. I'll assume you can see, see and hear okay. So thanks for the introduction. So I've been asked to talk about uh, the difference between modular and monoblock dual mobility um, and what are the pros and cons of these approaches. So I've been saved a lot of time. This is really dual mobility part two. I don't have to go into a lot of the uh, background detail around this because we've just had a fantastic talk laying that all out. So we're now familiar with what the dual mobility concept is. So this is a picture of uh, our current dual mobility uh, solution we're selling, which is uh, called Biomentum. Actually, as we've heard, dual mobility has a, a very long history and a lot of clinical evidence behind it. And pretty much the first dual mobility solution which was developed was the Nove dual mobility, um, which was developed in France and has a huge amount of clinical evidence supporting it. What we've done as a company is we've actually simply acquired that solution. It has been rebranded for us as Biomentum, but it is exactly identical to the Nove product. Um, and what that means is that we have a new, by, uh, new dual mobility offering in our portfolio, but it's supported by 20 years of clinical evidence. So as someone who focuses on the safety of our products, that's a fantastic situation for me to be in. Now, when we look at the picture of the uh, Bimentum, we've got on the slide there, we can see that it's as we just had described, we've got a small head articulating inside a large polyethylene head, which itself articulates against a metal bearing within a shell. And in this monoblock solution, because that's what this is, it's a monoblock, the metal bearing surface is part of the acetabular fixation shell. But there is another way of doing this, and that's having a modular solution. And we can see an exploded image of how that works here. So we've got the same small head inside a large polyethylene head onto a metal bearing, but that metal bearing is modular and it goes inside a standard acetabular fixation shell. Now, Depusynthes actually has one of these modular type solutions as well. It's only available in the United States at the moment, but in the US you can get our pinnacle shell as a modular dual mobility solution. I'm unsure. Um, it depends on the later situation in this country, but it's probably not for a year or two from this point. But it does mean that I can be quite even handed in my assessment around these things, because as, as a manufacturer, we actually have both of them. Now, 
We've already heard that dual mobility is very, I think I need to go into that again. There have been huge numbers of articles coming out on it over the past five years. And what they show across the board is that it does work in terms of reducing dislocation rates. And it tends to show pretty good survivorship, very good survivorship actually in these articles. But just as we've heard, it's not designed to be a solution for all patients having total hip replacement. It should be focused on patients who have an increased risk of dislocation. And for those patients, it still seems to be very successful in reducing dislocation. So this was a recent paper that um, I came across looking at its use either for patients, well, patients with uh, neck of femur fracture, but in this study, 20% of those patients also had quite a serious neuromuscular disorder as well. And they showed that even in these most challenging cases, you could still reduce dislocation rate and end up with a dislocation rate of around four to 5%. So I won't go into any more detail around that. I think we heard in the last talk that dual mobility is effective. But what about this question between monoblock and modular? Which one should we be choosing? What are the pros and cons? So if we look at monoblock dual mobility, well, the first thing which I didn't even write on here because it sort of seems so obvious to me, but it's worth stating is Monoblock was the original um, version produced in France. So it has that huge clinical history associated with it. It's very well tried and tested. We, we have, it's like the cry hip stem. We know exactly what we're dealing with in terms of performance. Other advantages, it doesn't have that metal on metal junction between the modular liner and the shell. Now that's not an articulation. There's no movement there but there is a metal surface being put up against another metal surface, a bit like we have on a trunnion and a metal head. And so we know from experience over the past decade or so that any time in orthopedics we put metal on metal, we just need to be a little bit cautious. We can get a better, so, and obviously that doesn't apply to the monoblock solution. We can have a better head to shell ratio with monoblock. You can basically put in a bigger polyethylene head for any acetabular shell size, and it tends to be about five millimeters bigger. And it's a simple solution, so it's potentially cheaper than the modular. But on the downside, you definitely can't use additional screw fixation through the shell, though there are other things you can do to enhance fixation. If you're doing it for revision, you definitely need to remove the old shell. And probably most importantly, there's no ability to revise your plan intraoperatively. If you're doing a pinnacle, you don't have an option because of what's facing you in the middle of the operation to switch to a dual mobility solution. And if we think about modular, obviously it's, it's all the other way around, the pros become the cons. And the one I'm gonna focus on most now because there's been the most discussion about it is this question about the metal on metal junction between the shell and the liner for modular. Now, the first paper looking at this came out in 2017 by Nam, who we've heard has published a number of papers on dual mobility. And he looked at a group of standard total hip replacements compared with a small group of modular dual mobility. And he did show that you can get raised metal iron levels in these patients. So four patients in the dual mobility group had a raised cobalt level compared with one in the standard group. It's worth realizing all patients having hip replacements, even standard ones, can get raised metal iron levels. It's just a question of how raised they are and whether it's clinically significant. And they didn't find any clinical correlation in this group of patients. They just found these raised metal iron levels. But now in 2020, we now have a systematic review looking at this issue and they asked a number of questions. The first was, what rate do you get in terms of raised metal iron levels? And how does that change over time? And their finding was that you do get raised levels. They tend to rise most at first over the first year and then to fall somewhat up to three years, which was their average endpoint. And at their final follow-up, they found that 5% of patients had elevated cobalt iron levels, which is consistent with what Nam found in their earlier paper. Second question I asked was whether the femoral head composition, because you can either have metallic or ceramic heads, whether that had an effect and they found that it didn't. 
And then lastly, did you get any ALTR MRI type lesions in the patients with the raised metal iron levels? Now, this one is difficult to comment on because it tends to be only those patients with raised levels that get the MRI investigations. And they did find that there were some mild lesions, but it wasn't in all cases, and it wasn't related to how high the metal iron level was, and they didn't lead to any revisions. So they didn't really show any clinical correlation with their findings. And then lastly, there's a really good paper last year in 2020, thinking about why this might happen, why you might see these raised iron levels with the modular dual mobilities. And what they looked at was the number of these implants that are put in with the modular liner not correctly inserted, mal seated, as they put it. And they found that actually this happens in up to 6% of cases and tends to be higher in low volume surgeons, as you'd expect. And you can see an x-ray there with the modular liner very obviously not properly put into the shell. And they then went on to do some lab work looking at this, and they showed that actually if you had the mal-seated liners, that led to a higher risk of fret and corrosion. And that might explain why you would get raised metal iron levels in those patients. So in conclusion, I think we now are fairly confident that dual mobility works well for patients at a higher risk of dislocation. And it should be reserved for, the, for those patients. This is not, it's not supposed to be a low wear solution. In theory, you will get higher levels of poly wear with dual mobility. So it should be focused on a specific set of patients. There are definite advantages and disadvantages to both monoblock and modular solutions. And on the face of it, modular has some very compelling advantages associated with it, particularly the ability to change your plan interoperatively. But there is this background issue with increasing numbers of publications of the fact that you do seem to get raised blood metal iron levels in a small proportion of patients with the modular systems and the use of a monoblock system like Bimentum avoids that risk. So at the end of the day, I think it's for surgeons to weigh up these risks and benefits in light of the patient in front of them. If you have a patient who you feel is at high risk of dislocation, it is probably worth accepting that small risk, of, theoretical risk of raised blood metal iron levels, even with a modular solution, to get them large benefit in terms of reduced dislocation risk and subsequent revision for that patient. So thank you very much. Open to any questions. Thank you, Josh. That was really good. Uh, may I ask you a question? Sure. Um, you mentioned about monitoring the metal iron levels and, and potential metal uh, iron debris. Could it be related to the to the backside between the insert in the shell and 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 does it have any clinical implications? Sure. So I think that the last paper I discussed, I think it suggests that that is where this is coming from. The uh, the metal on metal interface between the modular liner and the acetabular shell. And that if you haven't got that liner properly seated, it leads to an increased, increased risk of fret and corrosion, which was what they showed in their lab testing. And that might lead to this metal iron release. Now, whether there is a clinical implication from that, I think is at the moment, we don't have anything suggesting there is a clinical implication. And it was something I only learned when I started working in industry that actually, you get raised metal iron levels with all total hip replacements. So it really is a question just of how high they are and whether that has clinical effects on the patient. So I think this is very much one at the moment where surgeons should be cautious, should look at the literature that emerges, should be considerate of it, but we certainly don't have any, what I would call kind of safety signals around this at the moment. And certainly, you know, as a company, we wouldn't be uh, selling the pinnacle with it as a modular solution if there were any doubt around this. So I think that's that's our current understanding. Excellent, thank you. And one, one last quick question. What would be the size of pinnacle cup you, you need to, to get in the, the smallest size to get this uh, dual mobility? I, uh, I don't have the pinnacle numbers um, available actually because it's not available in Europe. So I can't say okay. for sure. I, sorry, I don't want to give an inaccurate answer on that. That's fine. So we'll wait for that info at some point. 
Sure. Thanks again. Right, let me introduce you to our next speaker, Deepak Harlekar. He's going to talk about constrained liners, uh, which is obviously very important in the revision in portfolio. Uh, Deepak's been uh, a consultant orthopedic surgeon for 13 plus years and with vast uh, 25 plus years of deep trauma and orthopedic experience. He studied originally in Nagpur and now working in Lancaster. He's a very high volume uh, hip surgeon uh, and a knee surgeon um, and also facilitates international visitations at Lancaster along with me. Over to you, Deepak. Thank you. You're on mute, Deepak. Okay. Would you like to share the screen again, Deepak? Yeah, that's yeah. fine. Can you hear me Excellent. well? That's fine. Okay, yes, thank, you, thank you, thank you Kunta, for uh, uh, those very kind words. And uh, good morning to all viewers in uh, UK and good afternoon to viewers in India. So I'm going to talk on the constant acetabular liners advantages and pitfalls. And I hope uh, uh, I'll be able to convince you after my talk in 15 to 20 minutes is that there is a place for constrained liners in the management of hip instability following total hip replacement. Uh, so my talk is going to uh, cover the history. How does a constrained acetabular liner work? Modes of failure, outcomes, indications, but more importantly, I'm going to show you technique of the constrained acetabular liners with a uh, few photographs and videos, short videos, and then uh, we'll discuss some of the cases uh, which I've done in the past. So uh, the first reference about the constrained liners was in 1956 in Moscow, Russia. As you can see on the right hand side, it was an all metal device. The socket and head were manufactured together and required the surgeon to assemble this with a femoral stem intraoperatively. The first publication, however, was in 1969 and authors then noted a constrained device may be associated with decreased range of motion potential impingement, enhanced interfacial stresses that may result in increased risk of wear, osteolysis and loosening, a statement that remains true even today. Now more use in clinical practice started since 1980s and it is getting more and more popular. And certainly in my practice, I have used constant liners since 2012 with really good outcomes. And I'll share those with you in the next few slides as well. The modern design requires the surgeon to snap the head into the liner at the time of reduction. A locking ring is secured in place around the rim of the cal to protect the poly. Now, these are some of the newer implants, the modern implants. Uh, all the major implant manufacturing companies have this in their portfolio. The principle remains the same, but there are subtle changes in their design. There is one slightly different constraint liner, and it is called as a a tripolar constrained liner where a bipolar head is fitted in a constrained poly liner. Now this is a typical uh, construct of an enhanced stability constrained liner or a constrained liner. As you can see, the most important feature of the, the poly is this extended lip. And the other feature is this titanium ring which fits onto this extended poly. Now how does CAL work? As you have heard in the first talk by Kuntal, when the jump distance exceeds 50% of the femoral head diameter, dislocation of the total hip occurs. Now what essentially the constrained acetabular liner does with this extended lip, you increase the jump distance and therefore the risk of dislocation is reduced. An intact soft tissue envelope is secondary stabilizer to retain the head when levering out. Now, when I say the soft tissue, the soft tissue would consist of the capsule the fibrosis that develops following hip replacement, as well as the, the muscles around the hip joint. And as you all know, the abductors play a very important role, particularly the posterior vertical fibers, which are dynamic lateral stabilizers. The function of the constant acetabular liner is akin to that of the soft tissue envelope, and therefore it reduces the risk of dislocation. The principal feature of the cal is to capture the femoral head. And therefore, at the point of impingement, greater force is required to lever out the femoral head and therefore it will in turn reduce the risk of dislocation. 
but this will also have an impact on the redu reduced range of movement, as you can see on the diagram right hand side of your screen. Now the forces which are driving the hip movement at the point of impingement are transferred to the polyethylene capture mechanism of the femoral head. And therefore, as you'll see in my next few slides, how important it is to have a very secure fixation of the acetabular component in the bone. And if you have a poor bone stock, then you really need to consider whether this is the right choice for your hip instability management. Now, how does a constrained acetabular liner fail and why does it fail? In the snap fit designs which we have now, the locking ring can become dislodged by repeated impingement or by malalignment. And I'll, I'll come to malalignment in, a, in my next slide. The force may be transmitted to other interfaces and failure can occur at any of the interfaces. And this brings very nicely to the modes of failure of the constrained acetabular liner. There are three modes of failure which are described in an article in Journal of Arthroplasty in 2003. The type one is at the interface between the acetabular bone and the prosthesis. Type two is due to the failure of the locking mechanism when the polyethylene liner uncouples from the metallic shell. And type three is the failure involved uncoupling of the femoral head from the liner due to the failure of the metallic ring where the femoral head dislocates. Now you have, as I said, you have another design which is called as a tripolar design. The first two modes of failure are pretty much the same. However, the third one is the dislocation of the bipolar component, whereas the fourth one is the uh, dislocation of the femoral inner head. Now coming to the outcomes of the constraint liners, uh, this is an article, a meta-analysis published in the Journal of Arthroplasty in 2018, where the author found that the mean dislocation and our failure rate was 11.4%. However, the data quality was insufficient for a robust meta-analysis, sorry, robust meta-analysis due to the fact that most studies were retrospective, non-consecutive, single-centered with very small proportion, uh, very small populations and limited follow-up periods. Very encouraging results of a, a tripolar constrained liner in the bone and joint journal in 2019. The authors found that at 10 years, the survivorship for dislocation was 95.6%, whereas at 20 years, it was 90.6%. Really good results following a tripolar constrained liner. A very good article published this month in Journal of Arthroplasty, where the authors found that the increasing neck length was associated with lower failure rate and the head size has not been demonstrated to lead the lower failure rate in constrained acetabular liners. And therefore it is important to aim at increasing the neck length or increasing the offset when you do a constrained liner in hip instability. Now, this is something by far the most important step in the uh, constrained acetabular liner in order to achieve a very good outcome of the, of the constrained acetabular liner. You must aim your inclination between 40 and 55 degrees, whereas antiversion between 20 and 40 degrees. Now, you will see from my next few slides where the cases I've, I'm going to show you, it is better to have more antiversion than less antiversion, as this will minimize the impingement or it will be, it will, it will be, it will cause a less late, late impingement and therefore slightly reduce the risk of dislocation. Now, what are the indications? Inadequate soft tissues and deficient abductor mechanism by far the most important indication. And as you heard from previous uh, talk that uh, neuromuscular disorders like Parkinson's, post-polio syndrome, cerebral palsy and residual weakness after stroke, uh, which is equally good important indication for dual mobility, but an indication for constrained liner as well. And a relative indication would be poor patient compliance or cognitive impairment. Now some technical tips. You must ensure that there is a decent acetabular bone stock for secure fixation. As you as you just seen a slide, a few slides before, that how important it is to have a secure fixation as the forces which are transmitted from the polyliner due to impingement are transmitted into the interface between the bone and the acetabular component. Optimal component position, I've just explained to you. Always secure and cemented cup with at least two screws. Now, if you are revising a hip for instability and you have a well 
fixed uncemented cup, there is absolutely no need to put any additional screws. Trial the reduction using one head smaller size and the reason for that you don't want to really damage the poly. The, the, lip, the lip of the poly is quite extended and if you try and use the same size uh, head as the poly liner, you risk of damaging the poly. You ensure that there is a snap fit after final reduction before ring is fitted. Make sure that ring is circumferentially fixed. It is easier said than done, especially if you have a very tight hip, this can be very, very fiddly. Now I'm going to demonstrate a case. Uh, it's unfortunately one of our own cases. Eight-year-old female had recurrent dislocation, eight year following uh, exeter cement and total hip replacement. Uh, we decided to revise this using a constraint liner. And as you can see, inclination of 50 degrees and antiversion of eight degrees was achieved. Unfortunately, eight month, 18 months following this revision surgery, she had a dislocation which required open reduction as it is almost impossible to reduce the constraint line or dislocation by a closed technique. Following open reduction, six months down the line, she had further dislocation and then we decided to revise this further uh, to improve the inclination and antiversion. And we did improve the in inclination and antiversion by about 10 degrees on either side. Unfortunately, just two weeks down the line, this happened resulting in a disastrous consequences for this lady ended up into a girdle stone arthroplasty. Again, emphasizing the importance of a constraint liner, do it right the first time. As they say in UK, get it right first time. When you're doing the revision surgery uh, for, for a instability using constraint liner, make sure that your component position is optimal. That is the single best thing to do to achieve a good outcome following constraint uh, um, a stubble liner. Another case, 82 year old farmer who had a well done Korab Pinnacle total hip replacement, had a traumatic dislocation 18 months and then developed instability, was revised using a constrained liner. 18 months he was doing fine and he had another fall, six, sorry, six months he was doing fine, had a fall and he dislocated his left hip. But if you look at the right hip very carefully, the uh, polyliner is partially disengaged from the acetabular shell. When you compare that to the exit on the left corner, left, left hand side of your screen in Jan 2019, the polyliner is definitely slightly disengaged. So we carried out the MUA of his left hip and stable, stable hip was achieved. The EUA of the right hip was also carried out. At the time it was found that the hip was stable and there was no movement of the, the polyliner. This patient remains uh, under close observation and we are lucky that he's still maintaining his hip well. But this is this will be considered as a type two failure that I just explained in my classification of failures. Now I'm gonna show you a technique uh, which, uh, uh, how you do the constant acetabular liner, which we did only recently. So this is an 86 year old lady, had multiple comorbidities, had a primary exit total hip replacement in 2004 by Hardinge approach. She developed instability since August uh, 2020, had multiple dislocations and hip was unstable at 40 to 50 degree of flexion and slight internal rotation as you can see on the right hand side there. So we decided to revise the surgery and the uh, revision was planned, uh, the femoral stem cement in cement revision and uh, for the acetabulum the options were to use either constrained acetabular liner or dual mobility. Uh, I usually use the posterior approach for all my revisions, well, most of my revisions. And when the hip was exposed, uh, as you can see in this picture, uh, the abductors were detached uh, more or less completely uh, with only a small uh, abductor attachment at the better trochanter. There was significant disruption of the posterior soft tissues as well because of her repeated dislocations in the last few months. So we decided to proceed with the uh, removal of the femoral stem, as it, as you can, as you know, the taper polished tepid stem are very easy to remove. The polished tepid stem was removed. To remove a fixed, well-fixed acetabular component, uh, the good technique is what is called as a ream out technique where you ream the acetabular component out, the polyliner out. So the polyliner was reamed out, as you can see on the left-hand side, this short video there. And when you ream it out, you leave the thin shell of the, the polyliner which is very easy to remove using 
the fine osteotomes. So as you can see here, the, the poly shell is very nicely removed. That leaves you with a cement mantle. And you can, if you remove that cement mantle very carefully using the cementotomes, and here we use what is called as a Moreland cement osteotomes. And as you can see here, you can take out the small chunks of the cement without damaging any of the acetabular, acetabular bone stock, which is again very, very important if you're going to perform a constrained acetabular liner fixation. So the after removal of the cement, as you can see, there is a beautiful spherical acetabular uh, acetabulum there with intact anterior and posterior wall with a good floor there. So the next thing is to trial the um, uh, component. And as you can see, a very good primary stability in nice two directions. Then you fix the cup and we used a gription cup here, which is which was fixed additionally secured with two screws, cancel screws. And then you fit either a trial liner or a, a definitive liner. We chose to put a definitive liner as the decision was made, obviously, to go ahead with a constrained liner. And then you trial this stem, put the trial stem into the cement mantle. But more importantly, when you reduce it, use a head size smaller. Now, in this case, the acetabulum was 32 millimeters and we use a 28 millimeter head for the trial. Now this is the final reduction after we implanted the definitive stem and the most important thing to consider here is to get the femur in alignment of the, the short video there, get the femur in alignment of the acetabulum and then you see the pop of the head going into the acetabulum that is when it is reduced. So I'll just play this video again for you. So get the femur in alignment with the acetabulum because you don't want to damage the extended poly. It has to be done very carefully and then you see the pop. So you can beautifully see that femoral head is being sucked into the acetabulum. Once that is done, then you put the ring on the lip of the acetabulum. Sometimes this can be very fiddly, but here it was not so difficult. And as you can see, the ring is circumferentially fixed on the acetabulum very nicely. Now, once that is done, the um, check the stability of the hip joint. And in this case, the hip was stable in about 85 to 90 degree of flexion with about 20 to 30 degree of internal rotation and 20 degree of adduction. I think a very good stable configuration was achieved on the table. Now, once you've done, as Kuntal explained to you, it is equally important to make sure that your soft tissues are repaired well. Now, as you can see here, the abductors which were detached were repaired using mitic anchors, and you will see that in the next slide on the x-ray, and the posterior structures were uh, repaired using the transosseous sutures. So this was the post-op x-ray. As you can see, the inclination of 40 degrees, uh, an antiversion of 35 degrees, and as I said before, a slightly more antiversion doesn't do harm in constrained liners. The reason for that, you have an extended lip, and you will uh, avoid the impingement in about 85 to 90 degree of flexion. But if you put the cup in a less antiversion, the impingement will occur at around 60 to 70 degrees, risking damage to the poly and dislocation. Another case uh, you've seen um, uh, PFR, uh, proximal film replacement, recurrent dislocation following uh, a cemented cup. This was revised using a constant liner and a good follow up at two years. Uh, Another case, 87 year old lady with multiple comorbidities had revision surgery in 2002, uh, started in stability in 2015. Uh, and as you can see, there isn't hardly any greater trochanter. Clearly she has no adductors there and with recurrent stability have developed a significant soft tissue uh, imbalance as well. So we decided to devise this using a constrained liner, as you can see on the right uh, on the right two pictures, a good inclination and good antiversion, and a follow up at two years. This lady is still doing well. We haven't we haven't uh, replaced the stem, and the stem was retained. Uh, this was Exeter cement stem. All we did is uh, change the the head to a modular head, which fitted nicely into the constrained liner. Uh, another case. Uh, uh, femoral head with uh, a skirting femoral head, recurrent instability, and a good outcome at six years. Uh, 
So important thing again is to consider that your alignment of the component is good. You have a good bone stock to have a fixation of the uh, acetabular component. So coming to my last slide, take home message. There is definitely role for constant acetabular liner in hip instability for a right indication and the right indication usually is a soft tissue imbalance but you should always have good bone stock. The implantation should be considered especially when all other factors have been optimized and importantly component malposition. As I said acetabular bone stock is very very important for stable implant fixation. Use cautiously in young and high demand patients because they will put a strain on your acetabular component, the polyliner acetabular component, therefore risk loosening. In our practice, it is the implant of choice for proximal hip, proximal femur replacement to provide a stable hip. I would like to acknowledge DPU Synthes for their educational support and thank Auto TV for the platform that they provided for this webinar. Please do not hesitate to contact us on nweducationacademy at gmail.com for any further questions or inquiries about clinical visitation. And thank you very much for patient listening. And I leave you with some beautiful pictures where I work, Lancaster. Thank you. Thank you, Deepak. That was an excellent talk and some really challenging and complex cases. Uh, so thanks for sharing those uh, with us. Uh, can I ask you a question? Of course. Um, see, see, you mentioned that with proximal femur replacement, uh, constrained liner uh, is, is the implant of choice for you. Uh, can you please explain and would you consider dual mobility for PFRs or, or would, would you almost almost always consider constrained liners? The, the, I don't think you can always uh, use the constrained liner for every single proximal femur replacement, but as it, I just explained in my talk, the most important reason why you use the constrained liner is when you have soft tissue imbalance around the hip joint. And when you do a proximal femur replacement, you have attached your, all the muscles around the hip joint and there is hardly any soft tissue stability. So if you implant a constrained liner and align it well, it works really well. But I'm, I'm pretty sure uh, somebody who's uh, using the dual mobility uh, in proximal femur replacement have good experience with that will equally do well. So it is, it is implant of choice for us at Lancaster, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it, it should be the implant for every single proximal femur replacement. Thank you, Deepak. That was very useful. Um, and, and just for the participants as well, um, you can still put your questions in the Slido bar uh, below, below the uh, presentation. Uh, we are coming on to case discussions, and then we'll be happy to, to discuss any pertinent questions that have been raised in that Slido bar as well. So our next speaker is Ravi. Um, so Ravi is going to lead on the clinical discussions and he may challenge and ask some of the speakers uh, uh, pick their brains on, on the cases he's going to present. So Ravi has been a consultant orthopedic surgeon at Warrington uh, for a few years. He's got 16 plus years of experience in TNO. He's a trauma surgeon and, and an upper limb surgeon actually. So he, he's going to uh, sort of uh, you know pick the uh, brain um, of the hip surgeons. Um, he has keen interest in artificial intelligence and machine learning. So he's a, he's a, he's a very clever, clever surgeon. Off to you, Ravi. Thanks, Kundal, uh, for those kind words. Uh, now, uh, we've heard uh, some excellent uh, and informative talks from distinguished panelists on this uh, webinar earlier. So uh, on background of uh, uh, those words of wisdom, uh, I've to present a few interesting cases and see, as Kuntal said, uh, pick up brains of uh, the panelists and see whether uh, their knowledge can help others to learn uh, and uh, improve their patient care. Uh, so the, the first case is, uh, this is uh, the 82-year-old male had bilateral hip replacement done in the past. The left hip was uh, done uh, nearly 25 years ago. Uh, was doing well uh, till last four years ago, had a fall and led to uh, a periprosthetic fracture. Now, this problem was dealt with uh, with the revision surgery uh, with the distal locking uh, stem, uh, but the cup was retained. Uh, now, this patient subsequently developed a dislocation three years post the revision surgery and followed by a subsequent recurrent dislocation. So that clearly has got a problem with these patients. Uh, now, what do we do with uh, such scenario? Uh, 
when the patient clearly wants to improve their function and the recurrent dislocation is uh, letting them down. Uh, Kuntal did mention about the algorithm. Can we use that algorithm in this case? Uh, so I'm going to ask one of our panelists, uh, Nikhil, uh, what do you think? Do you think we can apply those uh, algorithm principle here? And uh, what would you do in uh, this scenario? Uh, thanks, Ravi. Interesting case. Um, I think um, as we can see on that X-ray that you put, which is a post, you know, reduction X-ray, we can see a couple of things. One is that you've got a quite a heavy, long uh, stem in there. Most likely, the abductors are uh, deficient there. And um, looking at the algorithm, which Kuntal quite um, you know succinctly put to us. We need to look at the components. So um, to me, I would also look at the MUA and EUA findings, but uh, going by the X-ray first, the um, astibular component does look a bit open and possibly um, retroverted a little bit. So I would say that it falls into component malpositioned sort of side of the algorithm. And um, the abductors most likely, again, we can look at the EOA findings, but they look like the abductors are deficient. So to me, a, comp a composition of, uh, you know, where you've got a combination of malpositioned and uh, abductor deficiency, then you need to correct both. And the most likely outcome would be to revise the cup. And um, I would say a constrained liner, but um, the more you get experience with dual mobility and the jump distance that is required for uh, a dislocation, that might be an option. But in my current practice, this probably will be dealt with a constrained liner. So you, you're clearly following the algorithm here. And I think uh, that is the best way to guide somebody who wants to take up revision surgery in their practice to have some sort of algorithm in mind it may not necessarily fit into all the components of algorithm, but it gives you a good guide, isn't it? Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Without a doubt. So that's what it was done. Uh, do you think any, any uh, uh, criticism from this, uh, Nikhil? No, I think um, it would be very much what I would consider doing myself. So um, yeah, the um, cup looks in a good position on that AP and lateral view. Um, you know, best of luck it probably should work well excellent right let's move on to our next case then uh, so got a 74 year old uh, female she had her left uh, hip replaced uh, nearly 15 years ago it was doing well uh, unfortunately uh, she had her first uh, hip dislocation uh, nearly 13 years ago uh, 13 years post uh, initial surgery and had one more dislocation since then. Uh, although the hip was reduced, she has been experiencing uh, a recurrent problem with the subluxation during her day-to-day -day activities and clearly not happy with the way the hip is behaving. Uh, so that's what the X-ray looks like. It's showing the cemented total hip replacement. Uh, now this hip was a uh, decided to uh, take to theater and uh, do MUA. So I'm going to ask uh, one of our panelists, Kuntal, uh, this is the, the MUA findings. Uh, how are you going to uh, take this further? Okay, so it so looks like an EUA or examination that an CCA or an MUA has been done to assess the stability of the hip. And, and I think that's a good practice when you have especially recurrent subluxations in the history rather than just pure multiple dislocations. So it looks like the picture on the right with flexion, adduction, internal rotation, it's subluxing, isn't it? Um, so how much how much degrees did it come out in, uh, Ravi? So uh, clearly there was some telescoping uh, on longitudinal traction and the hip yeah. was stable up to uh, 70 degree of flexion, I think 10 degree of adduction and internal rotation, as you can see. Yeah. Okay. So my worries here would be, well, first of all, I would like to see a proper post adduction film I would consider a CT scan as well to, to check the component position. Uh, and the things to consider, you yeah, know, that's, that's a good x-ray. So the x-ray is cons conspicuously good, actually. There's no significant polywear that you can see on x-ray. The alignment uh, components are still well fixed. 
so my worries here would be um, some disruption to the posterior soft tissue. Second would be some anterior impingement, possibly uh, causing that uh, subluxation posteriorly. Um, and third could be some inherent offset issues with the C-stem design. This is a Roblevsky original C-stem design, I think. Uh, and that offset is not great. So I think it could be a combination of factors which is causing uh, the, the subluxation. So I think given that if, maybe if you try and follow the algorithm, given that this hip is 15 plus years, um, I would certainly want to consider that there is some issues with the component um, or at least certainly there is some wear of the component. Abductors seem okay to me uh, here. Um, my worry would be the soft tissue posteriorly, but certainly the abductor should be okay. Um, and I would want to consider, uh, given that it's a modular femoral component, uh, see what we can do with the head in terms of either increasing the diameter or the length. And in terms of the cup, again, removing any anterior osteophytes, revising the cup if needed during the surgery to, to, to remove the problem of the wear um, and, and uh, make sure the components are in good position. I think, yeah, you're right. Uh, if we follow your algorithm and we correct uh, those factors which have led to uh, this uh, recurring problem. So that's what was done. Uh, uh, interoperatively, uh, the osteophytes were found, they were removed. Uh, the cup was closed a bit more than what it was earlier. Uh, there was wear on the posterior side of the cup and the soft tissue disruption, definitely due to the recurrent dislocation. Uh, the stem was retained and the long head was used to increase the offset. Now, in one of your slide, Kunta, you did mention about the head neck ratio using the skirted head. Do you think, would you do the similar side, do, would you use a similar implant if you have uh, some other implants available or the inventory we talked about in this webinar? Uh, very good question, Ravi. Uh, and this is one of the hip, uh, you know, you know, with the current armamentarium, I would certainly want to uh, consider a dual mobility if, uh, as uh, Nikhil talked, uh, uh, and, and you know, it certainly improves the issues with the offset and the uh, jump distance. I would certainly want to consider that rather than a skirted head. Right, okay, excellent. Let's move on to our uh, last case then. Right, uh, this is one of my favorite cases. Uh, so this is an 89 year old lady had a, a you know, bilateral totally replacement done. Uh, the right one was done nearly 30 years ago. Uh, that's really long time, isn't it? Uh, now, clearly, uh, this was done with the trochanteric osteotomy approach uh, with the Charlie monoblock stem. Uh, the trochanter has uh, failed to unite. Uh, this lady did uh, develop a dislocation uh, after being in an awkward position, uh, and uh, that's the current situation with the x-rays. So as, uh, as you rightly said, uh, the first line of treatment, uh, Kuntal, is to take this patient to theater and do a MUA, and that's what uh, it was uh, decided to do. So once the patient was taken to theater, uh, the registrar was trying to get the hip reduced. Uh, and it's like a uh, common practice telling anesthetists, OK, we'll be there quickly in and out. Uh, the job will be done in five minutes. But I think uh, the Charlie stem, uh, I think had served this lady for long and decided to take a voluntary retirement, looks like. Uh, the stem was pulled out during this uh, manipulation and it created a, a frantic situation in theater. Now, I'm gonna bring one of our panelists, uh, uh, Deepak. Uh, if, if you are on the other side of the phone and your registrar rings you up uh, with this sort of situation, how would you calm him down and uh, what would be your next line of treatment? Thank you, thank you, Ravi. I think it's a very, it's a really interesting situation. I would, ra I would rather be in theater rather than sitting at home. But you know, in this situation, the most important thing is to make sure that your registrar doesn't panic. Okay, so if the stem has pulled out, it is almost unlikely that he will be able to put this back. These patients are. She's an 89 year old lady probably just consented for a manipulation and uh, perhaps open reduction. So I would just ask registrar, uh, just calm down abandon the procedure and put her out of um, her spinal anesthetic or you know, general anesthetic and transfer her to the ward. The next thing, you, we already asked, what would you do next there? So I'm gonna take, take this question as what would you do next? So if I'm the consultant managing this app, I really want to know, so I will get an 
X-ray and a CT scan done to begin with, and then plan my operation because she now needs a revision surgery. Thank you. So as you can see there, um, there is the, the problems here are, as you already pointed out, there is a non-union of the gritter to canter. Uh, you see there is a protrusio with a poor stubborn bone stock. The stem has already been pulled out. I just want to make sure that the stem has not damaged the, uh, the sciatic nerve and there is no neurovascular deficit there, rather neuro, I would say sciatic nerve deficit. So my plan here would be to uh, do a planned revision uh, and options here would be to consider she's 89 frail, pro probably multiple comorbidities, do minimum, but achieve the maximum. Cement in cement is always a good option and I have used it quite often in my practice. On the acetabular side, again, you will have an option of uh, impaction bone grafting, uh, you have a cemented cup, and if you find sometimes, you know, that, you know, just by getting the alignment right, getting the offset right, you don't always need to use the your mobility or constraint liners. Now, in this case, constraint liner, I would say, is my last choice because of the poor stubbler bone stock. So that would be my plan here, uh, Ravi, and I don't know what, what has been done, but, um, uh, you know, even if you can achieve by not using the dual mobility or constraint, you can still get good outcomes. Thanks, uh, Deepak. And uh, as you rightly said, there was definitely a problem with uh, acetabular bone stock, and hence uh, the mesh was put in. The uh, impact and bone grafting technique was utilized to have the better bone stock on the acetabular side, and they've done exactly what you are planning to do, and they managed to get the trochanter down as well. Uh, now important thing to do, Ravi, sorry to interject, but that is most important thing to do is to repair the soft tissues around the hip joint, which Kuntal has emphasized in his talk. And I also mentioned and showed that case, you repair the soft tissues around the hip joint after, you know, you operated for a constraint liner or a dual mobility, and that will give you the best outcome. Excellent, excellent. I think uh, we've covered some interesting cases here and the principle uh, you all uh, shared on this platform and how do you manage this dislocating uh, hip. So I would like to uh, thank uh, Deputy Synthesis for their educational support. Again, as uh, Deepak said, Ortho TV for allowing us to share this platform. Uh, so our next webinar, uh, from this series uh, would be on uh, management of a painful young adult hip and we'll share some current concepts with you that would be on 7th of march and as uh, kuntal mentioned earlier uh, we would like to use this platform to uh, share the learnings experience innovative ideas on this platform again and if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to email us on uh, nweducationacademy at gmail.com. Uh, we would answer all your questions. Uh, and if you email us regarding certificate, we'll post that across to you. And please do write if you are interested in uh, clinical visitation once the pandemic situation settles down. Thank you. Thanks, Ravi. I'll just briefly discuss a couple of questions raised by some of the candidates attending the webinar. Um, so for one of the questions is, I'll pose this to, to you, Deepak. What they said is, uh, is it how easy or difficult is it to assess the polyware as a cause of dislocation? Like that second case we discussed, um, you know, in a late instability case, how would you assess the polyware? How easy or difficult it is? And would you do any extra tests for that? Um, could a very good question, actually. Uh, sometimes it is very obvious on the X-ray when there is a polyware, you know, you 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 can you can you can compare the the serial X-rays if you have the you know the, the choice of having the, the X-rays from the past. That's one thing. Sometimes the subtle polyware is very difficult to assess on radiographs or on any investigation, uh, and sometimes you only find it intraoperatively that there is significant polyware. So if only part of the poly is damaged, it is difficult to assess that on by by any means for that matter. But sometimes easy to assess on X-rays. I don't think there is any. I'm not sure whether you guys are aware, but I, I'm not I'm not aware of any investigation which will precisely give you the polyware apart from a nice simple x-ray and you compare those with uh, the x-rays from the past. Yeah, and no, I, I think that's useful. Do you want to add anything else, Nikhil? No, I think he's absolutely right. Um, you know, um, 
CTs and X-rays probably give us more of the information unless we are going for more sort of uh, tests, which are you know more in the research side rather than in our day-to-day -day practice. Uh, Kuntal, very interesting question asked that I can see is that what is better in young active patients, athletes, a hip mm -hmm. resurfacing or uh, a dual mobility? Um, and I might start on this and the panel can take on on this. I think there's no doubt that doing a hip replacement, which is best in your hands, is probably the gives you the best outcome. So I would say well-positioned components and doing a hip that you're very aware of and good at is the best outcome for a young active patient. Hip resurfacing has got a bad reputation in terms of met lines. So it has fallen into disrepute. Um, and um, I think with the dual mobility, we need some long-term outcomes to start using it on a regular basis in young patients. So a very good question um, asked, and um, if the panel uh, feel they would do anything differently, then please, uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I think start? that's, yeah, that's spot on, Nikhil. I think uh, what works best in your hands is what you should stick to even more so for younger patients rather than changing and doing something really different that you don't normally do. So yeah, I completely agree, Nikhil. My answer is exactly the same, Nikhil and Kuntal. And I would I would certainly consider a large head uh, with a ceramic head and possibly a polyliner that remains the, the best configuration to date. I may actually pose the same question to Josh, given that we have got the expertise of Josh uh, with the product design as well. What do you feel, Josh? Do you think you see the future of dual mobility for a lot of younger people? I don't think so at the moment simply because we still don't know, uh, you know, what those implications are in terms of where. It's definitely a good solution in terms of dislocation, but we just don't know. I mean, uh, you know, the polys which are now being used in dual mobility are not the same as those that were used 20 years ago. Um, so it, it may be that it is a solution, but I don't think we have the answer as yet. So I would completely agree with the answers we've heard from the other faculty, which is, don't be changing something just because you've got, you know, a particularly young patient in front of you. Do what is best in your hands. And for most surgeons, that's not going to be, um, you know, resurfacing. But equally, you know, we've uh, Andy Murray, other sports stars, whatever. So it, it is being used by, by experts in specific situations. Thanks, Josh. Uh, that, that's um, a really interesting answer. I always say that, you know, not every one of us drives a, uh, Ferrari on a racetrack on a regular basis. So I can see why Andy Murray wants it, but we got to be careful of um, what we dream of. Kuntal, could I ask a question yeah. to panelists here? Uh, yeah. Uh, would, would this be a hip of choice for Asian population where sporting is one of their uh, daily habit? Yeah, I think, think the dual mobility that uh, yeah. in my extended indications you know that uh, you might find that there is a certain class of patients that wants a better range and stability and uh, you're right that we, we've always discussed this when we um, have our um, sort of talks uh, in the Asian population as to where they like to squat and sit on the floor and those sort of things um, and yeah that I think dual mobility might uh, provide that answer to some extent and very much like Josh has said, we need to see some long-term results with some wear outcomes to um, go down that line. So uh, yeah, the future will uh, tell us that. Uh, can, can I just answer over here? I, I wouldn't really rush into getting this into every hip replacement at this stage. We still haven't got the long-term outcomes for dual mobility. So uh, yes, logically it sounds good, but we should be still a bit cautious and patient about this. There is one more question regarding the, the third case that we discussed in a dislocation case and it is clear from pre-reduction x-rays that the femoral component is loose. Can we still attempt a close reduction? Um, again, you, you've got to be very careful in attempting the close reduction. Uh, and if, you, if you're talking about the third case, uh, I would say there is no harm in a gentle manipulation. And if there is any problem, just abandon the procedure and plan a, a proper revision surgery at a later date. Yeah. And I'll just add to your question, Ravi, as well, uh, about the Asian population and dual mobility. Uh, so I think we, we might be try 
we might be trying to solve one problem as in dislocation and range of motion, but what we don't want to was is to create a second problem. Uh, so unless we have the long-term data, I think we should see it, we should be using it uh, in a guarded fashion and following these patients up regularly. Right, I think, thanks everyone. I think we're coming to the end of it. Um, I, would, um, I would probably invite each panelist to just have a closing remark. I think uh, if they want to add anything, I think we've had a good discussion around with overview, prevention, management principles, uh, some sort of protocol, um, and all the different tools we can use in our practice. So I'll probably invite Nikhil first, anything you want to say to the, to, to the uh, attendees before we close. I think it's been a good um, sort of uh, talk and we've had some nice talks. So uh, no, there's not much. Um, I think, uh, thank you all for being here. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, Deepak? No, I just want to thank everyone uh, for wonderful contribution uh, to this uh, webinar and thank you to all the audience and for their questions and interactive participation as well. Thank you very much. Excellent. Josh? Just thank you for the invitation and uh, it was great to be able to participate. Thank you. Uh, Ravi? So thanks everybody to come on this panel and uh, sparing your time on Sunday morning uh, here. Uh, it's a good, I, mean, I think we had a good set of talks here which uh, pro provides uh, orthopedic training and a lot of established surgeons and algorithm which they can have in their common practice to mass solve this emerging problem, isn't it? Okay, right. Thanks, Ravi, and thanks to all the panelists. Thanks to Tony on the sidelines who've been supporting us as well. Uh, and, and thanks to Ortho TV for uh, obviously facilitating this. So uh, without taking any much of your time, enjoy your Sunday. And thanks again for joining us. And 